Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, How a Year of Service Prepares Young Adults for the Workforce. I'm Betsy Brand, Executive Director of the American Youth Policy Forum, and I'll be serving as moderator of today's webinar. We're very excited to be co-sponsoring this webinar with our partner, Service Year Alliance. For those of you attending your first AYPF event, AYPF is a nonpartisan convener that brings policymakers, educators, and researchers together in order to facilitate dialogues that lead to more informed policy to improve the lives of America's youth, particularly those who are traditionally underserved. And if you're unfamiliar with Service Year Alliance, that organization is dedicated to making a year of service a common expectation and opportunity for all young Americans as a way to tackle important challenges while transforming their own lives. Before we begin, I'd like to quickly run through a few logistical points. In the event of any technical difficulties, you may dial 1-800-263-6317 to reach GoToWebinar's technical support line. And if you happen to lose connectivity at any point during the webinar, please just go ahead and use the same link to log back into the webinar. Throughout the webinar, we encourage you to type your questions for our presenters in the questions box on the right of your screen, as we'll have a number of scheduled breaks for Q&A. We'll try to get to all your questions throughout the presentation, but if we don't, we'll do our best to follow up afterwards. Upon the completion of the webinar, the slides and recording will be posted on AYPF's website at www.aypf.org and on Service Year Alliance's website at www.serviceyear.org. This webinar today is the second of a three-part webinar series that is examining the benefits of a year of service to improving educational outcomes, preparing young adults for the workforce, and developing the capacity of nonprofit organizations. The first webinar was held on September 18th, and a recording of that webinar is available both on AYPF's website and Service Year Alliance's websites. The third webinar is going to be held on December 11th from 2 to 3.15 p.m., and a link will appear, uh, a, a link for this webinar uh, should appear in the chat box or will appear a little bit later. There it is in the chat box. Thank you. Uh, for those of you who are uh, social media enthusiasts, we'll be live tweeting today's webinar, and we encourage you to join the conversation using hashtag at let us serve or hashtag at service year, which you'll see on the screen. And also listed on the screen are the Twitter handles of today's presenters and their organizations. So today's webinar is focused on how a year of service can contribute to skill development of young adults and how it can help them prepare for success in the workplace. So let's get started. I'll be introducing the speakers in the order that they will be presenting. First, we'll hear from Ben Duda, who is the Managing Director of Core Member and Alumni for Service Year Alliance. Next will be Matt Walsh, who's a research analyst with Burning Glass Technologies. The third presenter will be MacArthur Antigua, who's a senior director, alumni engagement and cross-sector partnerships with public allies. And the final presenter will be Jessica Graham, strategic partnerships, inclusion and collaboration at Cisco. Um, ben will return after Jessica has finished her comments to provide information about numerous resources that Service Year Alliance has developed to help organizations and individuals become involved in a year of service. And as a reminder, we will pause intermittently for audience questions, and we'll have time at the end for Q&A, so be sure to send in your questions via the chat box. So at this point, I would like to invite Ben Duda, the Managing Director for Core Member and Alumni for Service Year Alliance, to the virtual podium, but just before you start, I do want to mention that we will show a two-minute video chronicling the life of a former Service Year member, member, Jermaine Castellanos. And just a word on the video, for those of you who are listening over the telephone, the audio for the video will actually come through your computer. So please make sure that your computer speakers are turned on and don't hang up. And then once the video is over, the broadcast audio will resume over your telephone. Uh, but for now, Ben, you're up. Thanks so much, Betsy. Um, it's really great to be here. Good morning and good afternoon to everyone who's joining us from uh, around the country and, and potentially around the globe. Looks like a really exciting mix um, of attendees. 
Um, as Betsy mentioned, I'm the managing director of core member alumni at Service Year Line. Um, I'm also a Service Year alum. Um, I'm an AmeriCorps alum, having served with AmeriCorps and Triple C, and also with Citizen Schools in Boston, Massachusetts, um, all in the uh, very early 2000s. Um, so we're excited to talk to you, everyone today about the role of service years in talent development. Uh, next slide. So what is a service year? So for those that are not familiar, a service year is a paid full-time opportunity to develop real-world skills through hands-on service. This can be um, poverty alleviation, this could be mentoring and education, this could be responding to natural disasters, but it's a meaningful, fulfilling, um, hands-on way to tackle the most pressing challenges that are facing our country. Um, you may have heard about the earliest instance of a service year, the Peace Corps and VISTA. Uh, AmeriCorps started in the early 1990s. Um, programs like Youth Build goes by literally um, hundreds, um, actually a thousand uh, different instances and names all encompass what we mean when we talk about a service year. Next slide. So what can that look like? So we had a campaign uh, that we've been doing called uh, For One Year This Is My Office. And this is, a, this is what those offices look like in partnership with uh, different service year programs around the country. Um, a service year actually, though, is your first office. So whether you're the main conservation corps um, working in, uh, on trails, um, whether you're with an environmental corps working on greening um, and energy efficiency, whether you're working with Literacy First or um, one of the hundreds of education cores. This is what that experience looks like. But actually, next slide. Because it's a first office, it's that first opportunity to acquire and build skills that are transferable across a career, across any industry, um, and are tangible uh, for a lifetime. So that conservation core, you're building teamwork, working um, with different folks with different skills and abilities in those. Uh, forest environment. Um, customer service, you're working with different residents of a community and talking to them about energy efficiency and greening and making home improvements. Uh, teaching is a tangible, specific skill. Teaching, mentoring, literacy, et cetera, all can be part of that first service year. Uh, so it's a really exciting opportunity to, yes, give back to the one community, but it's also part um, of the workforce development landscape, a part of the skill building landscape, and really part of building skills and what we'll be talking about for a, a lot of today's presentation, building skills that are transferable and are high in demand in the 21st century workplace. Next slide. So how do we know this? So through looking at research across sectors, um, from, from think tanks, from nonprofit leaders, from groups like Deloitte, um, we know that the US is projecting to have uh, shortfalls in some industries. We know that they're projecting to have, we know that we're in the midst of a very tight labor market right now. Um, so when we think about education, um, we actually have need for more uh, teachers and more individuals who are ready to go into uh, the education workforce. Um, we know uh, that uh, young people are lacking that first uh, experience uh, that is transferable to the labor market because there are less and less um, what we used to call entry-level jobs. There is actually no such thing as an entry-level job anymore. Um, in the 70s, um, you know, more than three quarters of employers would say, if you had a college degree, you were ready for the workforce. Now that number is closer to, to 30%. Um, so that's a that's an issue that's facing this labor market. We know that even in an era of tight, um, of low unemployment and tight labor markets, that unemployment among young adults is actually double that of the general population. Um, and that in, in order to address that, we believe and we have seen and we'll be able to prevent some research that, uh, uh, back that up is that a service year can be a powerful tool to both support and influence one, one's career direction. Next slide. So again, here talking back to the Deloitte research and some of the trends that we see. So in this instance of baby boomers leaving the workforce, in this gap that we talked about um, around entry level jobs and the education requirement versus job skills, um, we're seeing less incoming migration, population growth is slowing overall. Companies are experiencing labor shortage. This is context for what the public sector specifically needs to do, but really um, is part of the, the conversation overall and the conversation that supports the idea of a service year as a workforce development and the skill building uh, component. Next slide. 
So how do we see that already? And how do we see that online in its most direct and specific ways? Um, we have evidence already of how service years have provided a straight line path in a talent development conversation. So as we look at disaster response and FEMA looking to fill emergency management jobs directly through the agency or through their third party contractors, the FEMA Corps, which is a service year program, more than half of those graduates have gone on to work in emer emergency management related fields. Um, education, close to 50% of AmeriCorps programs are education related. Um, and we know that AmeriCorps programs are leading to more than 9,000 teachers annually um, being, being recruited from an AmeriCorps experience into teaching roles. And that's in, in, a, and in addition to that, we know that there's other tutoring, nonprofit education, nonprofit school-based, and other programs by which uh, AmeriCorps experience is providing a valuable precursor. Um, from a nonprofit management perspective, we know that one in two uh, AmeriCorps VISTA alums go on to nonprofit sector roles, and more than 85% um, of graduates from the program Public Allies, of which uh, MacArthur, who's one of our panelists, coming up later is going to speak more directly to of that pipeline around nonprofit management and leadership roles. Um, and then as we think about um, parks and conservation, Bureau of Land Management, forestry, and you know in the news, um, forest fires uh, and uh, wildland firefighters as well, um, we know that in that segment of the um, government and nonprofit workforce, um, and specifically the government part, 12% Park Service employees started with a student conservation association. And then in addition to that, in addition to the other areas um, beyond the park service, um, we know that the conservation corps and other youth corps programs are building a pipeline um, into those environmental careers. Next slide. And so those skills, I think, are specific to those industries that we named on the last slide, but then are also generalizable across industries. So we talked at the beginning um, with the My Office campaign about those 21st century skills. And so in survey research that we had um, done a couple of years ago, we knew we found that nine in 10 AmeriCorps members felt that they that their service experience helped them solve difficult problems, persist when opposed, accomplish their goals, um, handle uncertainty, um, and navigate uh, uncertainty and, and demonstrate flexibility, which is things that every employer of every industry is saying, both are the things that they want of their employees and are the, the skills that they're not acquiring. Um, in high school, um, in two or four year post uh, secondary programs. Um, and so that is a need in the workforce overall. Um, but service also does provide a sense of purpose. So um, over 80% of AmeriCorps alums say that service was a defining personal experience. Um, it points them in a direction, it makes new connections to community, new understanding um, of the myriad and complexity of issues um, and experiences that make. America what it is today. Um, and for Youth Build, and, and which is a program that specifically targets engaging opportunity youth, um, most of their graduates say that service has inspired them to do more and give back in their community, which um, many of us know um, is a prejudice that many hold um, towards, towards young people who might be um, classified as opportunity youth, that they're not connected, that they're not inspired to give back, and, and that um, we find the research is not necessarily the case at all. Um, and so in this career alignment that um, that, that, that service year um, has benefited um, the service year alum in their career, we're very fortunate uh, and lucky to have Jessica Graham, who is currently at Cisco, but got her start in the service year, still speak directly to those links between how um, service in the after school education program benefits her at one of the largest technology com companies in the world. Um, and then specifically, a service year can help one expand their network and have access to new opportunities that they wouldn't have. So foreign center alums find a good job through a connection that they made uh, through their service year. One of the initiatives that we have and one of the ways that this is again demonstrated um, is the Employers and National Service Initiative, which was launched a few years ago, that now totals up over 500 cross-sector employers um, that have said specifically and, un and equivocally, we are committed to uh, recruiting, attracting, hiring, and retaining individuals who have a service year experience, whether that be in AmeriCorps, Peace Corps, or other service programs. And that can range um, from private sector leaders like Disney and Comcast, um, public sector institutions like the JFK Library or the Department of State, nonprofit, 
organizations big and small, um, and, and as well known as the YMCA or the American Red Cross. So I think really exciting validation and insight into um, a service year being a foundational element that can that can help companies, organizations, and government agencies um, be able to identify talent from their service year experience. Next slide. So um, in, a, in a pithy kind of pivot, a service year really being um, this skills year, um, that it does provide complementary experience to that formal education, um, that, that building skills that are in demand by today's employers, um, their offline skills, their person skills, their interpersonal skills, um, you know, persistence and, and things that are um, intrinsic and are found in self, um, that that experience has signaled um, an increased interest in so employers of national service providing a, a talent pipeline, a talent identifier for the field. And again, we're fortunate um, that we say this, we hold this, we have this evidence, but excitingly, um, our presenter who will be coming after the video that we show um, is it both a return Peace Corps volunteer and works for a uh, da data analytics firm called Burning Glass Technology. And their resume research really quantifies these, this differentiation and increase and skills that are built through a service year. Next slide. Great, so now we're gonna transition and go to a short video um, featuring a service year alum, uh, Jermaine Cassiano, and his story of service and leadership. Uh, ben, thank you. That was a really an, just inspirational video, and um, Jermaine has done an amazing job. So that's uh, that's really nice story to see. Um, and thank you so much for your overview of uh, Service Year Alliance and uh, the programs that you offer. So we are next going to um, move on to hear from Matt Walsh, who is the uh, research analyst with Burning Glass Technologies. And he's going to tell us about research that Burning Glass has conducted that uh, that looks at the skills and educational attainment levels of service year members. So, Matt, you're up. Hey, everyone. Thank you for joining. I'm Matt Walsh, research analyst at Burning Glass. Thank you, Ben, for providing uh, that important context. Service as a first office, as an on-ramp, as an answer to the shortfall of millions of experienced workers. And Jermaine's video was, was particularly powerful in demonstrating that. 
Burning is a labor market analytics firm. We use artificial intelligence to read and parse millions of job postings and resumes. Our technology extracts the relevant information from those sources and compiles it into a massive repository of real-time labor market data. We've built a number of tools around our data, and these tools help universities, workforce development organizations, companies, government agencies at all levels align their operations and goals with real-time labor market trends. In the case of our project with the Service Year Alliance, we were interested in leveraging our data to determine the immediate and lasting effects of service years on the individuals who take advantage of such opportunities. I should mention that, like all the presenters today, I am one such service member. I was a Peace Corps volunteer serving in the Dominican Republic between 2014 and 2016. So it was particularly interesting for me to carry out this research, and I was able to see the findings reflected in my own life. However, people come to the service programs for many reasons, and what they get out of them is unique. Our research looks in the aggregate to determine what talents are developed during a service year. You can go to the next slide. We took a rigorous analytical approach to identify service year alumni and then built a peer group of similar individuals who did not pursue such service programs. We used three methods to identify service year alumni from our resume database. First, we searched for resumes that listed service programs like AmeriCorps, Peace Corps, Youth Build, Conservation Corps. We also looked at titles, for example, Corps member at City Year or Teaching Fellow at Citizen Schools. And we worked with the Service Year Alliance to identify some of those title employer combinations. Finally, we received a number of resumes that had been collected by the Service Year Alliance, and we incorporated those into our analysis. By the end, we had over 70,000 resumes identified, and we sorted on educational attainment both before and after the service year. Go to the next slide, please. To construct a peer group, we wanted to look at a group of individuals that was similar to the Service Year alumni, other than participation in a service year. So we sampled our resume database using the distributions of age, work experience, and gender that were present in the service alumni group. Then we sorted this peer group on educational attainment as well. So to the findings, if you'll go to the next slide, please. These are the general skills held by service alumni compared to and the, or, or in the rate with which they're presented on resumes by the peer group and by the service year alumni. The general skills held by service year alumni characterize professionals who build bridges, integrate into their places of work, and serve others. And maybe that's not so surprising, given the story that we heard from Jermaine. I'll point out a few skills that jumped out in our analysis. If you look at leadership, teamwork, mentoring, second language skills, we see that as leaders and mentors, service year alumni build inclusive teams, and they do so at a greater degree, at a, to a greater extent than their peers. Service year alumni are integrated into their places of work. Advertising proficiency in Spanish with such frequency speaks to the life experiences gained before and after service and signals the extent to which service year alumni are able to reach out directly to the communities in which they tend to work. In fact, more than just Spanish, 25% of service year alumni advertise second language skills compared to only 13% of the peer group. Um, once service year alumni have forged strong connections with their coworkers and project partners, they lead with a goal-oriented approach. At the table, you can see research, organizational skills, planning, creativity. These skills describe the systematic way that service year alumni achieve their professional goals. If we look to the next slide, these are more specialized skills. And the columns that we see again are the rate with which these skills are advertised on the resumes of service year alums versus the peer group. The top specialized skills advertised by service year alumni are teaching, tutoring, lesson planning, skills that are particularly important in the field of education. And that's where a lot of alumni begin their careers, as we'll see. These skills are also among the most frequently requested in the education sector, and we can tell that from analysis of job postings. So we see that the talent developed by service year alumni aligns well with the career areas into which they're seeking, entering or where they're seeking jobs. Um, service year alumni are further specialized in a particularly valuable way as revenue generators for the nonprofit sector. Fundraising and grant writing, niche, high skill competencies that are the lifeblood of the nonprofit sector, as well as public speaking. Um, that helps with re revenue generation, as I'm sure many people listening can attest. Finally, expert expertise in community development ensures that any of those revenues generated flow efficiently to the projects and communities where they can be the most effective. If we look to the next slide. These are the top distinguishing skills. 
distinguishing skills are those that are advertised more frequently by alumni in highly paid professions than by the rest of the service year cohort. Distinguishing skills for service year alumni include a mix of competencies from the private and civic sectors. Importantly, service year alumni can get ahead by continuing to develop some of the most common skills. So some of the skills that we saw earlier, if they're built upon throughout a career, can become distinguishing skills, such as research, planning, teamwork, leadership. These skills are already part of the professional vocabulary of service year alumni and developing them further can lead to higher, peshing, higher paying professions. If we look to the next slide. So what we can see here is the career area into which service year alumni enter immediately following their service. What becomes evident is that service year alumni continue to serve. They enter into professional careers that enable them to continue serving others. A large proportion began in education and community and social services, especially compared to the peer group. I'll draw particular attention to education. Nearly a quarter of service year alumni with a bachelor's degree follow their service year with careers in education, compared to only 6% of the peer group. For those without a bachelor's degree, 18% of the service year alumni enter into, enter into education compared to 3% of the peer group. Early career service year alumni are also much more concentrated in education, the, the height of that bar, than the peer group is in any other career area. And that indicates how overwhelmingly service year alum alumni enter into education. If we can look at the next slide. We see that many service year alums who initially choose careers in education or community and social services eventually leave, leave those fields for other opportunities. Five and 10 years after service, the proportion of service year alums in business and tech increases. And that column, that, that gray column on the right, represents the, fact, the fraction of the peer group that work in each career area 10, to, 10 years down the line. Interestingly, after 10 years, the proportion of service year alums in education is equivalent to the proportion of service years in business, and there's actually a greater proportion of service year alumni in business than their peers. It's important to point out these career transitions because each one represents an opportunity both for service year alumni and for those that may be looking to hire individuals with the skills that we mentioned earlier, like leadership, planning, creativity. If we can look to the next slide, please. These are among our most important findings, and they were mentioned by some of the earlier presenters. First, service year programs appear to promote bachelor's degree attainment. Those who participate in service programs without a bachelor's degree, so that is they go into the program without their bachelor's degree, are twice as likely to go on to earn their bachelor's degrees compared to peers with similar work experience. So that's over 24% of service alumni who serve without a bachelor's degree ultimately attain that degree compared to only 11% of an otherwise similar peer group. Looking at the difference between the topmost and the middle bar, we see that nearly a quarter of service year alumni who go on to earn the bachelor's degree had some college experience before their service program. They hadn't finished, but they had gained some experience. For these graduates, the service year could be an introspective gap year. It could be a meaningful practicum meant to focus a course of study or it could be the decisive stimulus that motivates a struggling student to finish her degree. Looking at that graph again, potentially more importantly, more than three quarters of service year alumni who go on to earn a bachelor's degree have no experience prior to their service year. For these individuals, service year programs likely play a very important role in their decision to earn a degree. Finally, in the graphs at the bottom, we see that service year alumni with bachelor's degrees progress to higher paying careers more quickly than their peers. This finding persists in the aggregate, even though service year alumni tend to work in traditionally lower paying careers like education and community and social services, which we saw before. If we can go to the final slide here, leads us to some takeaways. So we saw service year programs are likely to promote bachelor's degree attainment. Service year alumni seek careers that allow them to continue serving others, and they're overwhelmingly drawn to education specifically. Service year programs yield significant gains to alumni who serve without a college degree. And while many service year alumni establish, oh yeah, so while many service year alumni establish lasting careers in the social sector, others leave for the corporate world. So you have kind of a mix there that ends up balancing out. These takeaways suggest the following areas of opportunity. One is to support service year alumni during their many transitions as they go back to school, as they tr transition between career areas, 
or as they seek promotions and move vertically within one career area. Another opportunity is to connect service year alumni to occupations, career areas, employers, industries, where the skills they develop are most valued. We see some of that happening naturally as service year alumni move into business, but that might, the potential to accelerate that is, is present. Finally, within service programs, we ought to be thinking of providing service members with the opportunities to develop the distinguishing skills that lead to professional gains later in life. I'm sure some of the other presenters will speak to these points, and I'm very happy to answer questions about the research or about any of the conclusions when that opportunity is presented. Thank you all for listening. Great. Thank you, Matt. Um, that was really a fascinating analysis of, of the skills and educational attainment that service members um, gain, and what an important finding about the uh, get earning the BA in terms of comparison to peers who did not serve. So that's really important. Um, so we have a couple of minutes for questions. So Matt, I want to start with you first, just continuing on your research. A question came in uh, regarding uh, whether you were able to disaggregate data for individual subgroups, like students with disabilities or English language learners. We're able to disaggregate based on the things that are present on resumes, that typically tend to be present on resumes. Um, something like English language learning may show up in the presence of additional languages on a resume. Um, that's something that we were thinking about in doing the analysis. A lot of service year programs are in communities where participants have the opportunity to learn a second language. Additionally, a lot of um, service year alumni enter their program already knowing a second language. Um, we didn't look to disaggregate based on disability, which is uh, something that might not be represented as commonly on resumes. Um, and really the sort of disaggregations that we that we did look into were primarily on based on education, um, both because that is a determinant of which service programs you can enter into occasionally, um, and also because we know that education has such a big impact on earnings over the course of a career or the career trajectory that's available to you later in life. So that's the, that's the biggest disaggregation that we looked into. Okay. All right. Thank you. And um, just another question. Um, so when employers are presented with this information that you just shared with us, um, how do they respond? Are they more likely to want to hire service year alums? Um, I'm sorry, can you repeat that question? It was, how do employers respond? Yeah, like if you share this information that you just were telling us about with uh, employers, um, are they more likely to want to hire um, service year alums? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we haven't shared this particular, the, the findings of this research yet um, with any employers, but I can say that in a lot of other reports that Burning Glass has put out, we have identified certain skills that are, that are you know, constantly in demand by the workforce, skills like, like leadership and a way to sort of apply creativity, examples of um, bringing teams together, fostering collaboration. These are skills that employers really value. And what's particularly valuable about our research is it demonstrates that with the stories that service year alumni are able to tell post-service, they have a way to demonstrate that they are exemplars of these skills. And so that's going to be very powerful for employers. Yeah, thank you. Yes, I think being intentional and dis and or demonstrating the skills is a really big part of all of this. Um, thanks, Matt. So, um, Ben, we have a question for you. I think uh, as you were talking about uh, the young people that participate, um, one of the audience had a question about racial demographics of the young people that participate in a year of service. So could you provide us a little bit of background on the demographics? Yeah, thanks, Betsy. It's a great question. And, and just, I know we got a couple of questions on Twitter. I just wanted to put it out for the full group. Um, the, the Burning Glass Research is, is a study that we commissioned and the, the narrative and more information and more slides are going to be available when we publish it next month. Um, so definitely stay tuned to that from um, Service Year Alliance and Burning Glass. But in regards to your question, you know, it's an interesting one because the data is not easily accessible, to be completely honest. The service years in our country right now are primarily um, managed through a, a couple government agencies. Um, and especially the AmeriCorps model, when I said 
um, literally a thousand instances. There's about a thousand grantees of AmeriCorps this year. And so to ratchet up the numbers and the way that the funding is distributed um, can be challenging. What I can tell you um, is through work that we've done engaging service year loans directly through programs um, and activities um, over the years. And, and some of those being um, we, we convene virtual grad school fairs and higher education um, and job fairs. Um, the participants of those for, for individuals who did self-identify, um, we typically had 40 plus percent um, participants who were from underrepresented communities of color. Um, and so I think in terms of the disaggregate, MacArthur is actually going to be able to address that, that question specifically. But in aggregate, um, it can be hard to, to, to make a universal statement. Um, so what we have to do is, is kind of ratchet up different instances in order to, to tell the larger narrative. Okay, thanks. And um, another question, kind of sticking with uh, the employer sector, um, what kind of um, what kind of partnerships do you think are essential between employers and national service programs to kind of foster this talent pipeline from service to careers? It's a great question, and I'll give a couple of specific examples to demonstrate it in kind of across skill sets and service year experiences. So, um, so there's a there's a couple employers that are part of a larger set of um, kind of that energy um, greening, energy efficiency greening, um, uh, renewable energy industry uh, that I spoke to in in the early slides, and so a couple of the the companies in specific are ones like Franklin Energy. Um, and Green Knew It is another one based in Maryland, and there are others um, that are part of the Employers of Service program, but they specifically and directly target um, conservation cores and greening um, service year experiences and use that as a tangible and specific on-ramp to career. So in addition to participating in, you know, a virtual fair that we might host, they're specifically reaching out to those programs um, and looking for graduates as individuals to hire um, into employment opportunities with their organization. Um, another one is a service year program that, that many of us have heard of, Teach for America. They used da data-driven evidence that showed them that AmeriCorps, prior experience in an AmeriCorps education program or an education service year had a positive and significant predictive factor that led to um, completion of their two-year service year experience. And so Teach for America intentionally looks to recruit individuals who have previous um, service year experience in an education program. Um, and then from a higher ed perspective, um, programs like Carnegie Mellon's Heinz School, uh, the Heller School at Brandeis, and a number of others um, have told us, again, both you know, anecdotally and using data, um, that they find service year alums to have um, better experience that they bring to uh, their graduate program, that they're more actively engaged online, uh, in, on campus and in their internship and the programs that they end up getting better grades and better jobs. So they're also building intentional on ramps from individuals who have that service year experience um, into uh, additional uh, higher education opportunities to, to the advance their careers. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I know we have a couple questions, but uh, I think we're going to have to keep moving on because we have some more presenters. Um, so thank you so much, Ben and Matt. Um, now we're going to move to our next presenter. Uh, MacArthur Antigua, who is a senior director of alumni engagement and cross-sector partnerships with Public Allies. So, Mac, welcome. Thanks, Betsy. Uh, good afternoon. Greetings from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and good morning to those on the, in the Western time zones. Uh, Betsy, thanks again to, to you and the American Youth Policy Forum for this platform to talk about this. And I also want to acknowledge uh, Matt as well. Thanks for bringing the data. Uh, a lot of times when we bring data, we get surprised and affirmed, and that's happened for me. You know, affirmed that I think the story I'm about to tell uh, really lines up with all the data, but they're still surprised for me as well, and I, I look forward to highlighting that in this presentation. So as we go to the next slide, you saw the title slide there, y'all. You know, I thought, I, was I the only one who's supposed to bring embarrassing pictures of the past? Because that was my time 20 years ago, before the internet, as I like to remind many allies ahead of time, that's me and two of my fellow uh, public Allies alum from the class of 1997, where I worked at the Illinois Center for Violence Prevention. Again, Public Allies Chicago placed 30 of us throughout different not-for-profits throughout the Chicago area to do direct service in full capacity. And my work 
was around teaching a dating violence curriculum to young leaders uh, to make it cool, <laughs> right? Like, like, and I was like 22 at the time. So like, just give you perspective, hey, hey, make this relevant. And so from Cairo, Illinois, which is where the three rivers meet, all the way up to Rockford, uh, from the west side and the south side of Chicago, we're with young people from those communities to, to share that message. And yet to this day, uh, those people's uh, stories still reside with me and they still end up in our work. And that's you know, the work of public allies, which is advancing leaders, especially those that reflect their communities. Move them to the next slide. Uh, just to give you perspective, number one, as Ben said, there are many AmeriCorps programs. We've been with AmeriCorps for ever since its inception. In fact, we were a point of light project from uh, George Bush the Elder uh, back in the day. Uh, the mission of public allies is to build a just and equitable society and the diverse leadership to sustain it. Right? So we use service, a service is an arm for us, is to uh, reach those outcomes. And again, the vision is sort of honoring what the Constitution uh, said, right? A more perfect union, right? And out of many, one, right? That's, that's what we're about, trying to really honor that. And by leveraging the talent of people from communities to solve the problems that are closest to them. Awesome. To the next slide. Um, so our big mess uh, way, as I mentioned, there's an AmeriCorps apprenticeship. For over 25 years, we're part of the AmeriCorps and to do service. Um, and the way that this happens over a 10-month period is that we call them the allies or the AmeriCorps member does three things. Right? They do nonprofit capacity building. And in their week, it's about 28 to 32 hours a week. Uh, and again, one person is placed at a nonprofit for the 10-month duration. And if there's a cohort of 30, right, they're probably in at least 20 different not-for-profits. Sometimes there's one or two placed at each different one. Now they do the work at the organization that their placement, the practicum, we like to call it. And there's also time together, right? And they, they engage in our leadership development curriculum with their cohort. That's about 48 hours a week, four to eight. Finally, the last part of that triangle is what we like to call team service project. And that's sort of the remainder of the time, you average know, 40 to 44 hours a week. They actually work in smaller teams uh, to perform community projects alongside the residents. Uh, to execute that. And we'll uh, sort of speak how these things all play together on the next slide. So again, you talk about service and, and Ben outlined in the beginning, right? There's many ways to do service. For us, we look at it through the, the eyes of leadership. And so our model, our, you know, if you notice on one end, there's almost like a compass, right? There's four elements of leadership for us, right? There's the service itself, which we call practicum, right? You're performing at those are not for profits. And the other end of that compass, there's a cohort. You're not just doing it on your own, but you're part of Public Allies Chicago, which has over 40 allies this year. Or if you're part of Public Allies New York, which gets up to 50, right? Like we have different locales. They have a cohort. So you're convening with this group. You're reconnecting with this group. You're going out through the service. You're alone, but with others who are also doing this type of experience. The other, the east, the west side of that compass is this notion of reflection. Right, you need to create space for yourself to to, to take a the balcony view of how is this work going for me, how is this work impacting those that I'm trying to improve and serve. And on the west, the east side of that compass is this notion of training and learning. Right, you actually have formal spaces where you learn from local practitioners uh, about how to execute what we call our ten plus one leadership actions. Right, so it's not just to serve, but there's how do you serve? You know, how do you, how do you be inclusive? How do you make sure you're continuously learning? How do you build on the strengths of the folks that are there? And they're not trying to fix people's deficits, but rather trying to amplify what's already working. Right, we call it our 10 plus one. Uh, it's a clever way of not saying 11, <laughs> because, and, and what we like to think of the plus one is this notion of play, rest, rejuvenate, and heal. And why we call that the plus one is because we acknowledge in the field of working this field, it can be really hard to take that time to play, rest, or juvenile, and heal. So for our folks that are starting their leadership journey, we want to make a note, be sure you, you highlight that, because in order to sustain yourself for the long term, you're going to have to learn how to do that leadership action really well. And we, of course, we model that during three different uh, gatherings throughout the year where they actually retreat with their cohort to do that. Next slide. Now that we've given you the sense of how, how it goes, this is how it shows up across the country. There's 25 cities. We have 625, we call them the allies, they're American members, and they're working in cohorts, and it's about distributed around 466 different not-for-profit partner organizations. So unlike you know, certain uh, service groups that are focused on education, for example, or focused on one issue, public allies actually serve as an intermediary, right? They identify community partners uh, that have uh, relevant issues, that are tackling relevant issues in their communities, and they're actually creating a great environment for someone to start uh, start implementing the work, especially if they're from that community. So that gives you a sense of where we are located across the country. Next slide. And when you look at who it's comprised, you know, someone would ask that, and, you know, what's the race of the folks? To give you a sense of this year, 92% of the class, or sorry, this is the class of 2018, use a uh, sort of like a calendar year, similar to an academic year. You begin in the fall, end in the summer, 10 months. So this is actually the last year of graduating class. 
92% of the class represented groups that were traditionally denied access and opportunity in the United States. So it gives you a sense of, again, we're really trying to pull from folks in the community as well as folks leveraging this as an opportunity to move on to pathways of education or and or employment, or perhaps even another term of service. Next slide, please. So now the numbers I'm looking in front of you, we do an end of year survey and we talk to our not-for-profit partners and they report that one, that they ally because they're coming from the community and they look like the community, they're actually bringing life experience that are relevant to the issues that the organization is serving. And they're actually innovating the services based on that insight and based on that connection to the service population. We also know that they also report back overwhelmingly that the allies are uh, su supporting them to carry out the mission beyond their term. Right? So that's really exciting uh, to, to know that this is a true partnership. It isn't just what's the ally getting out of it, but actually our nonprofit partners are reporting that this is this partnership's working. Next slide. Yeah, there, but let's talk about more about you know today's call, which is what it's about the allies and what we know from hearing back from them on their end of your survey, again, that's from the class of 2018, that overwhelmingly they know that the service experience has influenced their career plan, right? And that they also agree, uh, strongly agree, that because they went through this, they are ready for future education and career goals, which I think meshes up with what uh, Ben and Matt were bringing. And finally, I think what we can, uh, well, as I can claim and name, the not-for-profit sector isn't the most obvious sector to work in, right? Um, I, I can say this, my mother-in-law still probably doesn't get what I do. <laughs> so like, right, it's not like in our society where you're gonna watch Law & Order, it's like, all right, I get what cops do, I get what lawyers do. But this sector, right, the social sector, still pretty uh, confusing and tough to understand. And yet going through this experience understands that where are the pathways? Is it through fundraising? Is it through administration? Is it through direct service? It's a through advocacy, right? 88% of our folks say that they see the potential career opportunities and they can do it. Uh, if you want to move to the last slide uh, right here. And one thing we look at, we're taking seriously now, you know, for the last few years is going, well, so what happens after the apprenticeship? Right? They've had this uh, container for 10 months. How are they doing? And we look at 90 days out after the apprenticeship and we've just heard back, right? So because again, the class just completed this summer. We've heard back from uh, our folks and they say 90% of them are reporting that they are currently employed enrolled in higher education and we're engaged in the second term of service. So we're, we're very, uh, you know, we're sort of seeing that's a good sign that affirms it, that actually number is up from the previous year, which is 81% at 90 days. So again, that sort of affects our, you know, that's, that's sort of informing us, how do we set folks up knowing that this term of service is much like a shuttle that launches into space, we're just the rocket tanks, that first part. What does it take to sustain them and move forward? And so, yeah, that's the public ally story. That's one example of how service can be done uh, to, to move folks into education and to employment. All right. Um, thank you, Mac. I really appreciate that. And um, I have to say, I love your leadership model, and I particularly really love the focus on the one plus to play, rest, rejuvenate, and heal. It's so important. So, so thank you for uh, telling us about Public Allies. Um, we will next move to our final presenter, so Jessica who is Strategic Partnerships, Inclusion, and Collaboration at Cisco, uh, is an alum also of a service program. So Jessica, you are up. All right, thanks so much, Betsy, to you and the American Youth Policy Forum, to Ben and the Service Year Alliance uh, team for creating this opportunity in this space. And Mac, we've crossed paths before as, as alums in this work, so it's nice to hear your presentation. I was just thinking I actually am taking advantage of the plus one you mentioned right now, uh, having just completed a really large project at work. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jessica. I work with Cisco Systems. It is a Fortune 100 company, $50 billion organization with um, presence in 120 countries. Our product is, uh, we're an IT company, and so for those of you not familiar, we kind of create uh, the tools and resources to make the internet work. And even this webinar right now is made possible via the routers and switches that Cisco produces. And so um, that's a little bit about the company of where I work. And um, if we advance to the next slide, you'll see a little bit of information about my title, my role. I currently work in the Office of Inclusion and Collaboration. That's um, often that other companies refer to as diversity and inclusion. It's a portion of our human resources organization. My role specifically is centered around attracting, retaining, and developing full spectrum diversity and making sure that we have active representation within our company to get the best resources for the business. Prior to that, I've been with the company about six years. 
I worked in our corporate social responsibility team, leading employee engagement programs around volunteerism and philanthropy. Cisco happens to have won the uh, number three award for the best places to work and give back. So we have aggressive and exciting programs to encourage our employees to volunteer in the community. And one of the reasons why I was recruited to do this job at Cisco is because of my tenure as an AmeriCorps alum and the work that I've done in the nonprofit sector prior to coming to the private sector. So I want to talk to you about that today and uh, we'll make sure to try to answer any questions both in this webinar as well as offline if those of you have those. As we advance to the next slide, you'll see a little bit about me. Um, I have titles, I have roles. If you go on LinkedIn, you'll see those. What you won't see and what I think is so special about the service movement is who we are as humans. And so this is just a little snapshot of some of my family, uh, both chosen and, and born, right? Um, in the top right is my great grandmother who just celebrated her 102nd birthday. Um, in the bottom left is my Cisco colleagues and family. Uh, in the middle there are my uh, the fellow cohort members at an executive education program I'm pursuing right now at Georgetown University. Um, bottom right, a group of us who served together and went to the Women's March this past year. I'm dialing in from Washington, D.C., and so have so many different layers of diversity, right? And as we talk today, I think Matt's presentation and Max's presentation, we've heard that um, the really unique thing about the service movement and what's compelling to employers is the opportunity to be inclusive and to solicit and develop talent that reflects not just diversity of experience, but diversity of thought. And I know that's something that at Cisco we're really committed to. Um, and I know it's something that all of you are probably committed to as well. Uh, next slide, please. So here's just a little snapshot of my journey. Um, I let people always wonder, like, where are you from? I'm from California, and I ended up going to a historically black college in Alabama. And so that was something that I did very early in my educational career. Uh, it was my dad's alma mater, actually. And so I really uh, found that to be like a really nice transition, talking about diversity of experience, going from California to Alabama. I also had an opportunity to do a study abroad program in Spain and uh, develop some language proficiency. Uh, I think Matt referenced that in his presentation. Um, my service years were with citizen schools in Boston, Massachusetts. I was an AmeriCorps teaching fellow. At the same time, I was, had the opportunity for, to pursue a master's in education, and it was a fantastic program for me where I was able to be a community builder, an organizer, do parental outreach, and really look at leveling the playing field and closing the achievement gap, both from the lens of a practitioner in an after-school program and the lens of a theorist right, going to school and thinking about, like, what are the strategies and pedagogical talents that people in these fields use, and how can I turn around and apply that in the real space? My service years were some of the moments where I built some of the most important relationships in my life, both mentors and sponsors, as well as friends, and people that I call um, uh, and look to as uh, mentors to me now today. Um, it's a really special opportunity that I'm sure if you uh, are not yet interested in, you probably are becoming interested in now. Um, after my service years, it was not surprising to me that I was able to be, um, stay on full time and take on some leadership roles with different organizations, both with citizen schools, I build also an organization, a national nonprofit organization. I stayed in that work for about seven years. And uh, I'm really grateful to have had the opportunity to develop my leadership skills there. I moved into the private sector actually on accident, and then this may come up, but I was so excited about being of service to my communities, to students and families who often need support in, in, in finding access to resources. And uh, one of my roles was actually to focus around corporate partnerships right, the both financial and human capital resources that nonprofits rely on. In doing that work with Cisco, I was invited to join the team to provide services for our employee base. So I've been there ever since the last six years, um, and it's been a really exciting opportunity. If you advance to the next slide, um, there's a little bit of detail around some of the skills I use today that I actually learned in my service years. And I was talking to Ben about this over the weekend. Um, everything I do now at a 70,000-person company, huge budgets and, and expectations, 
a lot of it I actually learned in my service years, everything from how to work with stakeholders to risk assessment and SWOT analysis, fundraising and donor engagement, how to lead, how to lead change, how to do public speaking, how to work, how to pull those long hours and make sure you show up well and represent the groups of people you're supporting, how to be patient, how to ask good questions, and most importantly, how to look at celebrating difference as the most critical thing we can do to create the 21st century that, that we all believe in. So I, I was really, um, I felt highly qualified when I made the transition from the nonprofit sector to the for-profit sector because I had already done everything. <laughs> I had already had an opportunity to lead um, and work alongside people that I was um, inspired by. And so that's one of the things that I would say has been helpful to me in being able to drive the deliverables uh, that I do uh, now in my current work. As we advance to the next slide, you will see um, a prompt. I would just encourage all of you to be curious. Um, for those of you who are people managers and leaders, or for those of you who are maybe exploring a service year, my experience uh, has been that curiosity has led me to door opening time and time and time again, just being sincerely interested. When I was in my service years, I had absolutely no visibility to what fundraising looked like. And I remember asking our development director at the time, hey, I'm kind of interested in this. Do you think there's any way I could like help out? And as is often the case in small organizations, help is always welcome. And next thing I knew, I was deputized as the staff leader of the staff fundraising campaign. Well, that opportunity led me to be hired for a full-time role in our development organization just the year following. That opportunity then led me to another opportunity, and so on and so forth. All of it started with being curious. And as we advance to the next slide, you can see a few snapshots of things that I have taken as my approach, both as an alum of AmeriCorps, as a passionate advocate for service, and now as an advocate for inclusion and diversity. So I would just say with, to all of you that it's important to be yourself. Don't curb your enthusiasm. Absolutely try to beat your personal best. This is something that I uh, test myself on. You know, I went from working with groups of 300 people to groups of 3,000 people to now groups of 30,000 people. Every single time, I'm constantly asking myself, how can you do better than the last time you did something? Uh, relationships are super important. Um, I, I think we are all have experiences of people who've invested in us, and I would say my goal is to always pay it forward and invest in other people. I think talking openly about your dreams and interests has been helpful for my story and my um, career trajectory. There have been many things that I was curious about, like I said earlier, and I think being able to say, I'm interested in this. I'd like to do this. Do you know anyone who can give me an opportunity to learn this new skill? You'd be surprised how often the answer is yes. Um, and then the last two bullets I'll say is to choose your mentors and your sponsors. Um, this is something that I actively practice, something that we teach our employees at Cisco, is that sometimes the most ambitious thing you can do is to say, I don't know, but who does know, and how can I get that person to help support me? So reach out to people who are doing the kinds of work that you're interested in, who are asking the kind of questions that you think are compelling, and work with them. The last piece, outcome committed, forum flexible. I see myself forever and always as an advocate for inclusion and service. And I have to be honest, I don't mind where I do that work as long as I get to do that work in some capacity. I think a lot of times we can get really fixated on, do you wanna work in a nonprofit? Do you wanna work in a for-profit? Do you wanna work in education? I'm agnostic on the forum. I think the outcome is the most important. And that's been my story and what's worked well for me. I think the last slide is um, just my role today, just a recap. Um, happy to answer any questions around Cisco's approach to attracting, retaining, and developing diverse talent. We are a proud supporter of the Service Gear Alliance uh, portal. I think it's called the Exchange, excuse me, Ben. And one of the reasons for that is because it's been yet another opportunity for us to identify high quality non traditional talent and get them to be a part of our organization. So thank you for the opportunity, uh, Betsy, and I'll turn it back to you. 
Thank you, Jessica. Um, I kind of wish you were my uh, employer employment coach because it sounds like you have so many great suggestions for helping young people develop skills and kind of move forward in their careers and lives. So thank you for your story. Um, we do have a few minutes for questions before Ben comes back to talk about some resources that um, Service Your Alliance has. Um, so let me start off with a general question for everybody, and I think we'll just Maybe go in reverse order. We'll start with you, Jessica. Go to Mac, Matt, and then Ben. Um, so it's clear that a year of service has had a really positive impact on all of you four people who had experience and are doing really wonderful things in your lives. Uh, and also, it's had a, a very positive impact on um, thousands and maybe hundreds of thousands of young people uh, across the country over many years. Um, if you could do one or two things to promote more service or um, more years of service, uh, service year, um, what would you do? I know funding is an issue, that might be one thing, but um, what are some of the things that you would do in your organizations to promote um, a, a, a year of service for more young people? So, Jessica? Yeah, one of the things I do actively is I tell everyone I'm an AmeriCorps alum. And uh, in the private sector, people often say, what's that? And so it creates an opportunity for me to tell them. Um, and many of my colleagues have kids who are themselves interested in pursuing these opportunities. So I'm a resource to them and making referrals to public allies and to other organizations that, that are associated to AmeriCorps. Um, I would also say just maybe don't overthink it because it's going <laughs> to be awesome. <laughs> So if anyone's worried about, oh, I don't know if I have like another year, I want to go get my MBA, like it's absolutely mm -hmm. worth the year and it pays huge dividends. Great. Cool. Okay. Mac, what would you say? You know, I, th I think when I, you know, the perspective of uh, someone who wants to do a service here, it's, it's an investment, right? Because again, you're not getting paid a lot of money. Those, as Matt pointed out, those high paying gigs tend to happen a little bit later uh, if you're doing it right. But I, I do think you can leverage Right, amazing connections, amazing people. Like for example, in, in, in a public allies cohort, you're being with 30 different organizations, you know, with peers. And so that, that's just a, if you're interested in making change and you want to work in that sector, there's no better way to get the lay of the land in that year. And you're going to meet people who do that and they're going to, you're going to grow up with them. So I, I think if you're thinking the long game and thinking, how do I literally build a cohort to sustain myself for the long term, I think a service here goes a long way towards preparing you for that. Great. I think I would pick up on a point that you were making also. Um, there's not much career guidance and counseling available to many young people. So mm -hmm. if you have an opportunity to go into 20, 30 different organizations and just get to know them, that's, mm -hmm. that's such a benefit. So, um, mm -hmm. Matt, how would you answer that question? It's a, I think it's a great question. Um, and I think there are a lot that we can do. Um, as individuals to promote more, you know, promote service years for everyone. I think what Jessica said about introducing yourself and when you can um, share your experience. And then, you know, importantly, really don't don't treat it as kind of maybe a, it's not a, it's it's not a throwaway experience. It, it's it's not really a, something that that you that you do for a year for fun. Um, it really is a opportunity for professional development and I think that we can all um, agree that that, that we, we, we developed a lot professionally in the program so sort of tying your service how it formed you as a professional throughout the rest of your career is I think very important and to not kind of treat it as this as this gap or something that um, you're doing between opportunities and then the other opportunity is or, or, the, or the other way that we can sort of promote additional service years is to advocate for it. And so that means um, in kind of the traditional way for funding at different levels of government, but also to advocate for service opportunities when you're in school or when you're at work to pursue maybe pro bono clients or to organize service endeavors with some of your coworkers and to have, um, whether it's a large company like Cisco or any, any Sort of smaller type of employer really pitch in and get involved in in those service opportunities because while it's great to have a full year in the structure of a program I think that you can get a lot of the development um, both personal and professional out of any kind of service great thanks Matt um, Ben how about your thoughts on how to promote more year more service years 
Yeah, so I, I mean, I would give a very a broad base and super specific. So super specific first is um, send send those young people to servicegear.org. We've got a marketplace um, that we created to really disrupt the process of finding and identifying a service year pathway. Um, the systems in place are hard. The organizations that uh, host service years range in size and scope and technological capacity and name brand recognition. And our our site um, has created a universal home for that that really helps the young person identify their interest areas, when they want to start, where they might want to serve. And so from a, from a strictly tactical perspective, it's a great first place to start. Um, from a broad-based perspective, I think it really is, is, is reflected back in um, these fantastic panelists that we've been able to convene today. You know, if I think about the idea that a service year can lead you to a career at Cisco, but we also have alums in our network at Facebook and LinkedIn and Wells Fargo, it goes on and on and on. Um, you know, individuals working um, in, in uh, you know, technology and analyst roles like Matt, and then this nonprofit pipeline where so many AmeriCorps alums, so many service year alums are working in the nonprofit sector um, from executive directors, any role really across the sector, I think it's really, and then actually just to think about the election last week, the, uh, the new, uh, there's a new Minnesota uh, representative that was elected and she's AmeriCorps alum and, and is actually the first Somali American and one of two first Muslims in the country who will be in the house. Um, and the Lieutenant Governor of, of Pennsylvania also is, um, is a service year alum. So just to really, you know, I think part of it is, is um, you can't be what you can't see. And so when you think about it in totality in these different instances, examples, it's, it, would be, it would be a hard argument to make that a service year would be a hindrance to the career that I want to have. Um, so, so the inverse of that is a service year could actually be a real supporting and launch pad for the career that you could, you could achieve. And, and, and so I think that that, that um, that storytelling is a key part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and let me just follow up since we've been talking a lot about skills and skill development. All of you have been uh, involved in a service program. Um, so to each of you, and we'll start with Ben and then go Ben to Matt to Mac and Jessica. Um, so which one or two skills, I know this is a hard question, but which one or two skills uh, that you develop during your service year do you think has really led to your success? So, Ben? Um, so I'm going to be super, uh, I'm just going to embrace uh, and fail forward with, with my response here. Um, I think my service here taught me um, a, a level of self-awareness that I wouldn't have otherwise. And, and the, one of the instances that comes to mind is, um, is, is just the way young people reacted in a in a, a group of sixth graders that I was working with through citizen schools and, and the way that they expressed to me their, how they felt that they weren't being heard, um, just had a real long lasting um, impact on me in the way that I communicated to groups, communicated to individuals, related with teams, um, related with my peers and coworkers. And so I think that that, I, I don't know if I would have had that without those humbling experiences along the way that were, that were put upon me through you know, the rigors and challenges that, that one faces in a service year. Great. Thank you. Um, Matt, what, what one or two skills did you learn or develop? Another great question. Um, you know, I think that during my service year, um, uh, again, Peace Corps volunteer in the Dominican Republic, I learned how to adapt as um, both kind of a person and a professional to unique situations and environments. And I would say the most important aspect of that adaptation was learning how to listen to the people that I was working with um, and bring their sort of loop them fully into the to the feedback loop on any project that, that we were doing because I was really kind of totally beholden to their approval of any initiative that I wanted to get off the ground. Um, and you know, really being being tied to their approval and their support on the projects that I was running has influenced the way that I think about my role in the professional space and also how I really interact with everybody around me in, in, in a much personal way as well, much more personal way as well. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Manak? 
Hi. Uh, man, wow, what a, what a lovely question. And I had to think about it really quickly. And I will say this, uh, my public allies here, I got to go to all 70 cities, uh, sorry, 70 neighborhoods in the city of Chicago and be with young people and understand them. And what I got was that they have so many strengths and you build on people's strengths. People aren't deficits, but rather people have full assets and gifts. And that was my year that reminded me. And I think that holds when I look at issues from a micro to macro level, there's giftedness and fullness. What do we do to amplify it? What do we do to connect it as opposed to trying to solve or fix things? I'm not saying it's the only way to do it, but man, when I got that lens and I'm able to hold that lens, it leads to sustainable uh, ways uh, that I think can actually be more inclusive and, and, and be long-term you know, successful. Yeah, very nice. Very nice. Thanks. Jessica? Oh, tough acts to follow. I agree. Uh, I was first thing in mind, Bessie, was um, dogmatic optimism. And I, I think those words may be like weird that go together, but it's just this um, unavoidable reality, I think, that when you enter the service community, you feel like I am in a position to make a difference for someone, even if it's only one person, it matters to that one person. And luckily for many of us, we have an opportunity to support even way more than one person. And I think that is really compelling. So I learned how to translate my passion and inspire others. And that's something that I learned to do consistently and repeatedly, to never take no for an answer, to always try. And I think it shows up now in my career as a skill. People call it leadership. But I think what it really is is being able to see a vision and bring people with you. That's great. Well, it's pretty obvious that the skills you all learned have nothing to do with academics and that a great part of what we need to help young people develop are these skills that are learned in other settings aside from classrooms. So um, thanks for sharing all your insights and your personal experiences. Um, I'm going to ask Ben Duda to return to the podium. He wants to talk about several resources that um, Service Year Alliance uh, has developed. And so, Ben, please come back. Great, thank you so much, Betsy. Um, and thanks again to all the panelists. It's just been a really fun, exciting, and um, really just energizing conversation. So, so from Service Year Alliance perspective, we just wanted to highlight and share some resources that we have available um, for, for all, all of our, you know, broad range of, of participants uh, attending. Um, so we have a resource hub at resources.serviceyear.org. Um, next slide. That, that has a number of different resources for the field, for service year programs, organizations, and core members and alumni. I wanted to just quickly highlight two. Um, we have a post-service year prep checklist um, that can really help existing service year programs or sites that are considering hosting a service year think about how they start talking about the transition um, after a service year for their members during the service year. So that's a tool um, that is really an amalgamation of best practices from the field. And similarly, um, the, the, the resource on the right is the Translating Service Year Skills Worksheet that we build that can be both for, again, um, programs and host sites, but also for members and alumni that really uses the foundational um, uh, themes that were built from the Business Roundtable that look at the skills um, required in the workplace and divide them into personal skills, people skills, workplace skills, and applied knowledge and help a young person think about um, in the context of their service year, how that service year experience, how the responsibilities of their service year um, can be translated into skills um, that are those skills that we've been talking about, that are the skills that are the 21st century workplace is really looking for. And we think it's, it's very important for um, young people who are doing a service year and who have done a service year um, to be talking using a skills-based framework so they're not explaining what service is or what service looks like, but also really linking it to how um, that service experience has helped them build skills as, uh, as our fantastic panelists have, have each done uh, this afternoon. Next slide. Um, this is also um, uh, some additional resources that we built. Um, specifically to how to translate those skills onto a resume. So we just wanted to highlight a few of those. Next slide. So again, just to close, um, as an organization, Service Year Alliance, um, we mentioned the, the online marketplace, serviceyear.org. We're committed to um, growing and expanding the, the amount of folks that are interested, so working on national recruitment awareness, um, but then also supporting members while they're serving. Um, we want to um, influence growth and quality at an organizational level so that 
the field is expanding, there are more opportunities to serve and those experiences are stronger. And then we do focus on policy and advocacy because we do believe um, that there can be um, local, state, and federal um, initiatives in play that could help us expand uh, service year opportunities so more young people have a chance to serve. Next slide. So if you're interested in service as a talent development strategy, and really, as we think about and, and looking at the exciting mix, mix of attendees that have joined us today, you know, are you a company, are you a policymaker, an advocacy organization, a nonprofit, a K-12 school, a higher ed institution? Um, we want to work with you. We, we, have, we have both the audience, the resources, the interest um, to really uh, partner and expand this talent pipeline work. Um, because I think, you know, as we've been talking about today, the service year really is, um, and, and it's great to have the burning glass research to affirm this, it really is a skill building opportunity that can help to um, accelerate, translate, build new opportunities um, for any young person in this country. Um, but it is also something that allows service to connect us uh, to our communities and to one another. And so we want to hold both of those things. And I think it's, it, you know, I think it's, it, you hear that in the passion of all the presenters today, that there is um, change in person and change in how we show up in our work. And both of those things are really outcomes of a service year experience. So, you know, on behalf of our organization, Service Year Alliance, um, we do want to thank all of our partners and panelists today from Burning Glass, um, uh, from Public Allies, from Cisco, um, so Jessica MacArthur and Matt, thank you so much for your contributions. And thank you um, in, in most part to um, our partners and colleagues at uh, American Youth Policy Forum. Um, as Betsy mentioned at the top, this is the second of a three-part series we've been doing together this fall and a really exciting opportunity for how we can connect um, our work, our organizations, and our audience um, uh, to, to move our country and communities forward. Wonderful. Thank you, Ben. And yeah, you see on your screen the registration link for the third webinar, December 11th. So uh, also the link in the chat box you can click on. Um, so I just want to reiterate what Ben said. Thank you to all of our fantastic presenters for your knowledge and expertise and sharing your personal experiences. It was really a rich and deep conversation. Um, I want to thank the audience for attending. Thank you so much. You will get a webinar. I'm sorry, you'll get a survey upon exiting the webinar. I hope you'll please uh, complete that. We really do listen to what you say. And all the materials will be posted on AYPF's website and Service Year Alliance's website. So once again, thank you to our speakers and thank you all for joining us. We hope to see you at another AYPF event soon.